Good morning, everybody. My name is Toby Dershowitz. I'm Vice President of Government Relations and Strategy at FDD. I'm so thrilled to see so many familiar faces from the defense community, from the Hill, uh, from the media, the diplomatic corps. We're thrilled to have all of you with us today. We're also thrilled to have so many new faces here. Um, also, we are live streaming today's event. I welcome those who are watching from a distance. Today, we'll be in conversation with several members of FDD's military affairs shop. Uh, we'll be hearing later today from John Capella, John Shanzer, uh, from Mary Beth Long, um, from Michael Waltz, and we're also thrilled to have Patrick Megahan here today, who manages FDD's interactive military.edge uh, interactive website. You will get a, um, a wonderful tour of that at a panel in just a little while. We welcome the opportunity to work with all of you here. If after the program you have ideas about how we could work together, we welcome the opportunity to hear from you afterwards. Just a very few housekeeping points. May I respectfully ask that you silence your electronic devices at this time. Also, we'll be having back-to-back -back panels, so if you could be mindful of that and just, um, if you can, stay seated because we're going to be moving very promptly into the next session. Um, and with that, I'm very pleased to hand the conversation over to our moderator, Michael Gordon. Welcome. Hi, I'm uh, Michael Gordon. I'm a New York Times person, but I'm, I'm doing a um, writer-in-residence um, position here at FDD to work on a project on the counter-ISIL campaign. And I um, recently just got back from, um, from the Gulf uh, to do some research uh, for their project. And it was um, uh, really striking to see uh, just how many multiple uh, regional contingencies are, are going on, at, a, as you know, at this time. I mean, formally, we have a, uh, a large coalition of more than 60 nations uh, united um, against uh, the Islamic State. And then there's a smaller number a in terms of the military coalition of Western nations and, and Arab states. But in reality, what you have is multiple <laughs> overlapping conflicts in which uh, different uh, states in the region really have different adversaries. I mean, the Saudis are a member of the um, coalition against ISIS, but in in fact, uh, the weight of their effort is, as you know, is directed, uh, is focused on Yemen and a proxy war they have uh, in their mind going with um, Iran, and that goes for a lot of uh, the other Gulf states who are not nearly as involved in the air campaign as they were at the initial stages. Turkey is an important member of the coalition and has made its uh, base available at um, Incirlik, but in reality, its principal adversary is not ISIS, but the PKK, which it bombs regularly in Iraq. Um, you have countries like uh, Russia that's not part of the uh, coalition um, and nominally is fighting ISIS, but in reality has been far more focused against uh, opponents of Bashar al-Assad and more recently against uh, American trained uh, forces that are going against, against uh, ISIS. So uh, we have a a, a region where uh, there's a formal coalition, but that in reality there, there are a lot of nations uh, pursuing separate uh, military agendas. Um, and we have a, a, a civil war in Syria, a conflict zone in, in Yemen, a campaign against the Islamic State in Syria, uh, in Iraq, uh, Iranian uh, forces in Syria, Hezbollah involved in Syria, and as if that's not enough, uh, there's a, a kind of a regional arms race uh, going on. So it's, it's probably, uh, it's a region that's uh, chronically in turmoil, but I think probably uh, more so than it, it really has been in quite a long time, and that's the, that's the subject matter um, for this panel. And um, I'm, I'm going to ask a few questions and then turn it over uh, for questions from the audience. So just to start with uh, Michael Hanlon, uh, I'm going to introduce our guests. I don't want to speakers. I'm going to do it very quickly, though, because I think you all know who they are. Uh, Michael Hanlon, at, at the far end, is at, at the Brookings Institution and um, a very well-known authority on, uh, on defense issues and extremely um, uh, prolific. Uh, Michael Waltz has, uh, was an SF um, 
uh, commander in Afghanistan and an advisor on counterterrorism issues to um, uh, Vice President um, uh, Cheney. And John Capello here has a lot of real world experience um, as an air attache in Tel Aviv and Serbia, I learned in the elevator this morning. <laughs> so, um, and, and really 25 years of actual real experience in, in, in the Air Force and a, an expert in a lot of trends in the region. But to start with, uh, Michael Hanlon. So, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, regions in the world that have arms races. Um, Asia uh, has its own tensions. How does the um, Middle East stack up compared to the other areas that are uh, the focus of attention? And given the multiple conflicts that I've uh, just very quickly ticked off, uh, what kind of strategy do you think the United States has to deal with all this? Well, thank you, Michael. Good morning, everybody. It's nice to be here. And by the way, let me sing a quick word of praise for Michael Gordon. We were just joking in the so-called green room that in the Middle East, he's often uh, referred to as Michael Jordan, a little bit of a mispronunciation, but a very telling one and very appropriate. <laughs> this really is the Michael Jordan of defense reporters throughout my whole career. <laughs> and, uh, and so it's nice to be up here with you. And uh, I guess the first thing I would say about arms races in the region or in the world in general, in some ways you could argue the Middle East is the only place that has an arms race. We say there are arms races elsewhere. And of course, Asia has a lot of successful economies and therefore their defense budgets tend to rise. But if you actually look at their defense budgets as a share of their economies, as a share of their GDP, they're pretty modest. China is less than 2% of GDP. By the way, that 2% is still the NATO target that we chastise all of our allies for not achieving, but we don't give China any credit for being below it. <laughs> uh, and so I'm not, uh, I'm not trying to say that China underspends on its military, uh, but I am saying China's at 2%. South Korea, which has a severe threat to its north, is at 2.5% of GDP, which is less than ours. Uh, Taiwan, 2%. Japan, 1%, and everyone gets nervous the minute it ticks up to 1.01% and calls it an arms race, <laughs> but it's not. It's just that we've, for a long time, all felt that Japan is better off around 1%, Australia, 2%. So anyway, the point I'm making here is that the Middle East stands out for being different. The Middle East is the place where people really are pumping a lot of money into their militaries, even as a fraction of the size of their economy. And if you go through any recent tabulation, you'll see most countries are somewhere between 5% and 12 percent, 13 percent uh, of GDP being devoted to their armed forces. And so that's the first point. There really is, by that measure at least, an arms race. But the second point I'll make, and I'll leave it at this for an opening, is just to say one has to ask to what extent these arms races really are increasing the probability of interstate war. We have a lot of internal war. We have occasional <laughs> interventions by, you know, the Saudis in Yemen. Well, that's notable as much for how much the Saudis placing almost American-style constraints on what they do, primarily air power, limited ground incursions, uh, as, as it is by anything else. We have a Syrian civil war in which everyone is meddling, but mostly from a distance, uh, with the exception, of course, of Assad's friends, who are a little more directly engaged. And so uh, I guess one big question on my mind is as the Middle East races in this sense, militarily, with countries keeping a wary eye on each other, is there really a likelihood they're ever going to use these arms against each other? Or is this mostly about preparing themselves to deal with internal threats and with possible proxy interventions in various conflicts with a relatively low likelihood that interstate war will erupt, especially if the United States stays engaged as the outside guarantor of Gulf security, as I hope it will. So yes, it's an arms race environment. Uh, but I'm not, per and yes, it's a chaotic, anarchic environment with a lot of violence. I'm not persuaded the chances of interstate war are high as long as we stay engaged in a way similar to how we have been historically. So let me follow up with Michael sure. Waltz on, on that very point. Um, uh, since so many of the arms, are, first of all, the United States is one of the main purveyors of arms to the region, and so are other Western countries, a lot of it seems to be intended as a um, gesture of reassurance um, in the wake of the JCPOA or Iran agreement. Mm -hmm. I was on a number of carry trips and it was emphasized, well, we're selling them arms and giving them defense capabilities. So should, should, is this, should this be a matter of concern or is it just, uh, uh, you know, um, business as usual in the region? Well, just to, to add to Michael's point, because I think he raises a great one, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's worth examining, do we have a disconnect? I argue that we 
do from our, our Gulf allies in particular and the types of arms they're buying versus the threats they face. Um, uh, on the one hand, we're buying, no offense to my Air Force brothers, but we're buying lots of shiny planes, missiles, radar systems, uh, what have you, which we know from our, just to be candid, from our own defense procurement is, is very exciting and, and, and things that we like to buy and it, and it projects power. But if you look at the actual threats that they're facing, it's irregular warfare, it's hyper urbanization, uh, moving from rural to, to kind of these slum-like cities. Uh, it's food scarcity, it's water scarcity. We're looking at Sana'a in our lifetime as the first major world capital to run out of water. And, and how is the region going to deal with that level of instability? So, you know, as I've, I've engaged at least at the, at the military level and, and now in the private sector, a lot of our allies, what are you guys, what are you guys buying for? You know, what's the strategy? So for example, we all love drones and we all, loved, we all love ISR, and particularly uh, folks in the Gulf right now, are you, what, what's the requirement that you're buying this stuff for? Are you buying it for state on state warfare? Are you buying it for border control? Are you buying it for internal monitoring? Are you buying it for targeting? Because that's a very different strategy and it's a very different system that you need to be procuring. Unfortunately, what we're seeing is that I think we're doing a lot of buying with not necessarily that's synced with the requirement. Well, okay. is this, let me ask you, is this just a, a waste of their uh, considerable resources? And if so, why should we care particularly? Or is it, um, is it, got, is it potentially destabilizing and a cause for concern, the, the sort of arms transfers that are going on? Don't get me wrong, I'm all for allies buying American air power and American weapons and keeping our industrial base strong and, and creating American jobs. That's fine, but I do think it's worth examining is there a disconnect between the threats that they're facing uh, and their procurement strategy. Do, should we care and do we care? Sure. Uh, on the one hand, we're asking our Gulf allies in particular to do more, to be more engaged, to, to actually you know, make this coalition more meaningful. But on the other hand, I don't know that we're necessarily helping them uh, in the way that we should with the strategies that they need to face their actual threats, which is primarily internal dissent, destabilization, insurgency, and irregular warfare. Well, um, John is an, is an expert on, on this region and the only non-Michael on the panel. Can you, um, can, you, uh, can you take up this point because um, obviously a lot of, and it, I think it's something you're, you know, you, you've addressed, a lot of the um, instability in the region is coming from so asymmetric threats, groups like Hezbollah, um, uh, you know, transfer missiles to, to, to that group, if the experience it's gaining and from fighting in, in Syria, it's not a state that's buying, the sources of instability in the region come as much from that as from, you know, uh, Gulf states wasting billions on, on, on uh, fancy arms. So, Right. You know, what do you, what do you see as the concerning trends? Well, I'd like to take his take your point just a little further. Mm -hmm. right. I mean, while you're hitting it right on what their threats are, they, they face multiple threats though, right? You, I mean, you know better than I, spending the time you have in the Gulf, they are concerned with Iran. Mm -hmm. And so this type of conventional capability, they see as a, as a real need to counter the Iranian, the Iranian threat. And when we look at the balance in the region, we focus, we focus primarily on these conventional capabilities, these high sophi highly sophisticated systems. But then I, I would also agree with, with both Mike's um, that we need to take a look at the irregular threats. I mean, we need to examine the irregular threats and how that affects the balance. Um, the unconventional low-tech uh, capabilities that are proliferating also. When we talk about balance of power, we, we talk about the shiny, pointy systems, but sometimes we, we, we lose, it, lose sight of the, uh, the less conventional. Um, additionally, the actors, you, you mentioned this earlier, the actors with competing <laughs> interests in the region. So we look at, look at Syria as an example. You know, we have the, the Russians, Assad regime, uh, Iraq, Iran, Hezbollah, all of these, it's a microcosm of, of the problems we face and there's a multitude and a spectrum of, of threat from the conventional to the, to the regular and unconventional threat. And this is something we need to pay more attention to, I believe, uh, in our examination of how to move forward. Uh, Michael Hanlon, uh, so um, 
we have Gulf states concerned with Iran. We have um, groups like Hezbollah. We have all sorts of uh, trends going on in, in the region. Does, there was a question I asked you at the outset that you alluded. Does the um, United States have a, an effective strategy to deal with, this, with these multiple threats? I don't think we are doing very well right now. I, you know, the region's in remarkable chaos, and clearly a lot of it was initiated for, by forces either beyond our control or forces that had metastasized and morphed from how they, you know, originally began, let's say, in the early 2000s uh, with al-Qaeda. Uh, but nonetheless, it, the problem is that you can talk about the big themes, the big trends, the big tectonic forces, Sunni, Shia, schism, Iran's uh, aggressiveness and so forth, but you have to solve the problems country by country because each one has to figure out a political military solution to its problems. As you well know, e covering both the State Department and the <coughs> Pentagon as you have, none of these problems can be viewed as either just one or the other. And so with Yemen, you're going to have to figure out some kind of power sharing again or <laughs> division again. But I don't think division is very realistic given that country's resource base. So it's going to ultimately require some kind of power sharing which probably means that a negotiation has to end uh, or follow a successful change in military dynamics. So they're interconnected. Uh, and therefore, just how to get that balance right is going to be a function of Yemen and its various players and you know, what the prospects are for getting the key individuals to negotiate. You can go through that same kind of analysis country by country. The places where I think we're closest to having a viable strategy, uh, although when I say closest, that's a relative term, would include Iraq, where at least I think we know in theory that the government we have there now, we would like to see get stronger and we would like to support them, although they have a million problems and we're going to have to keep influencing their behavior. Uh, perhaps we have a tolerable strategy with some of the GCC countries, even though they're autocracies and we have a long-term political problem being too close with them. Most of the rest of the region, and especially the areas of civil war, I don't think we have very good strategies. Um, and, you know, I think Yemen, probably Libya, Syria are the places where we're furthest from anything that's viable. But I think you almost have to take one of those at a time to come to any kind of progress in your thinking. So um, I liked what Michelle Flournoy said yesterday at her conference at CNAS about trying to work, uh, you know, trying to operationalize the safe zone concept in Syria where we would try to convince the Russians and Assad not to attack how we would retaliate against Assad if they attack certain zones. That's the kind of detailed thinking you need to apply to any one of these cases to really make headway. It seems that the, the United States has a military strategy to fight uh, ISIS. It's got a, which is having, making some headway, but got a long way to go. It's got a diplomatic strategy to deal with the crisis in Syria that's failed utterly. Um, it's got a, a strategy uh, toward uh, for the Gulf states to provide reassurance through uh, a, a variety of means, training programs and arms sales. But it, it's not clear that all these different uh, strategies are knitted together in any kind of comprehensive approach to the region. They seem to be sort of separate initiatives for separate problem sets. What what do you what do you see as um, well, what I mean, do you think I the United think States needs to again, focus Again, going on? back to going back to Syria, sure. that's it's an exam it's actually the example of piecemeal the piecemeal approach. And we've got we're treating ISIL and the Russians and the regime separately. We've got separate sort of piecemeal approaches to each one of those. I I would happen to agree that the days of a comprehensive all-encompassing national approach to Syria, a uh, solution in Syria, those days are gone. It needs to be a local, local solution. Um, and this idea of safe zones, I think part of the problem with this idea of safe zones and no-fly zones is that it's become, <coughs> these become political catchphrases and they've lost kind of policy significance and relevance. <coughs> and I think we have to kind of take a, re-examine and take a look at those again because, uh, uh, for example, let's look at this at the South. I mean, the, the ability to uh, leverage the opposition forces in the South, uh, I think, is, is, is possible in limited areas um, with support, with training, with, uh, with monetary support. These forces can protect themselves. Uh, you know, train, we'd have to train and equip and, I mean, the, working through the details, but providing some semblance of normalcy provides an option 
and a and a movement forward. I mean, there there needs to be a start, and because it's been so difficult in the past, doesn't mean that we shouldn't re-examine and relook at this idea of of safe areas. Yeah, you know, one you just oh. before we leave the safe areas, and I'll turn to you. Sure. But the um, um, you know, th one thing the administration argues is that while the, the, the concept of a safe zone uh, might have been somewhat feasible uh, perhaps a year or two ago, uh, the Russian intervention in Syria has complicated it a huge thing uh, because uh, they obviously you don't want to have an inadvertent confrontation with the Russians. How would you manage that challenge? No, clearly the, the Russian intervention has complicated it, but I don't think the Russians get to veto our our action and our policy. I mean, look, a year, uh, just a few days ago would have been easier. Now the Russians are, are bombing in the south. The fact of the matter is that we haven't pr protected, allows, the Russians have no inclination nor any incentive to negotiate in good faith. I mean, I think that's clear. I, thi I think it's very clear. Besides providing safe area for the opposition to, to train and to operate and to establish governance, this provides leverage. It also provides leverage for the Russians and, the, and Assad's regime to understand that we are there to stay, that we are there to protect those areas. And I think it also provides some semblance of option for those in Assad's regime that may be looking for to the day after, that, there's a, that there is an alternative, that there potentially are uh, partners to sit down and, and negotiate a, uh, a settlement of some sort. Okay. Just wanted to add and a then couple, and then Michael yeah, yeah, sure, sure. a couple of very brief thoughts on th on this. Uh, first of all, when you do have a Russian presence, you have to avoid some of the classic approaches for enforcing a no-fly zone that we would have historically, perhaps considered. And so, I don't think you shoot down or try to shoot down any plane in the sky. What you do is you wait and see who violates edicts that you have put forth for certain parts of the country being no-go zones, no bomb zones, and then you retaliate at a time and place that you are choosing against Syrian regime aircraft that might have violated those kinds of concepts. That's one thing you do. Another thing you do is you try to develop local proxies without even being able to exactly articulate in advance the end game. I know this, this smacks of incrementalism and slippery slopes and snowballing, but we have gotten ourselves too uh, stymied by the need to have a theoretically perfect, mm -hmm. intellectually perfect concept for where we're headed. The Russians just went in and helped their proxies, helped their friends. Hezbollah went in and helped their friends, and now they're in a better position. I think that's the kind of concept we need to apply as well. And the third piece is the, the end game diplomatically, I believe, should be confederation. In other words, we are a long ways, realistically, from driving Assad from power. I'm not sure it's going to be a realistic proposition, and I'm not sure it matters that much that he be removed from power altogether in the Alawite sectors of the country. But I think a confederal arrangement where he is essentially governing uh, in, a, in a way that's been codified by some kind of an accord, a Bosnia-style plan, only the Alawite slash Christian sectors and the Sunni Muslims and Kurds never have to live under him again. That's a reasonable proposition with a weak new central umbrella government to, to you know, call uh, itself the government of Syria, but most of the governance and most of the security provided locally in these autonomous zones. I think that's the concept we need. For some reason, that you may get better than I, because you've been following Secretary Kerry around, he is adamantly against this kind of concept. I don't get it. I don't get what's wrong with confederation, when to me it's the only realistic way to, you know, connect the various pieces of our strategy or lack thereof. Yeah, no, Michael, I wanted to go back to, you know, do we have a strategy? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think, yeah, we have a strategy. I don't agree with any of it, <laughs> but this administration has a strategy, and the strategy is to, is to cozy up to Iran, where they see we have common ground, uh, is to, and, and the results of that, I, I mean, uh, as the administration looks across the region, they look at, with, you know, do not have large U.S. land forces engaged in costly wars when we have domestic problems at home in the Middle East, prevent Iran from getting uh, a nuclear weapon, and, and essentially, you know, let's let the region deal with its own problems. So, you know, that then means accommodation with the Assad government and backing off those red lines, accommodation with the, you know, it's understandable from the administration's standpoint, the Russians would work with their proxy, and it means allowing the Iranian army uh, into Iraq. So there's a, there is, I think, a somewhat of a strategy in place, 
I just think it's absolutely wrong and taking us in a very dangerous direction that will lead to proliferation across the Middle East and proxy wars and essentially uh, a cold war between Saudi Arabia uh, and Iran that we're seeing play out across the Middle East, but now even to places like Pakistan, Afghanistan, Malaysia, Sudan, and others. Does the rest of this panel agree with that? I agree with the mics. <laughs> um, however, I will say I'm, I'm not so sure that the strategy is that is that is that. Well, yeah. So if we're choosing between a bad strategy and just yeah. a lack of strategy, yes. Um, uh, when when it comes to our current state of affairs, I, I look at um, the the president that gave a. Uh, the commencement address at my alma mater on June 2nd at mm. the Air Force Academy. And he, he provided the future leaders, future Air Force leaders, some lessons he learned as, uh, as commander in chief. And the first one was to be clear eyed and watching and looking at the uh, at world events. And then he talked about sometimes military force is necessary, mm. but military, fo then the fourth, uh, uh, you know, was that military force is not the solution to all of our problems. And I think that is indicative of, of the problem within the administration and the thought process about using military force. Military force equals large ground components getting mixed up in, a, in the Middle East <laughs> civil wars. And that's not what we're talking about at all. I mean, yeah. there, are, there are, is a full range of military, mm -hmm. and, and you know, I'm not telling you And covert you options. Yeah. Of course. There's, there's a full menu of options available. Military is a tool. It's a tool to achieve political objectives, and those political objectives have not been defined in, in the case of, of Syria. And we, we, we piecemeal it, and we throw drones here, we throw a couple guys here, you know, another 200 guys here, and, and it's just not a comprehensive approach to the, the situation that we face. So strategically, I'm going to give them a brief. I, 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 actually, I think this is a good, a good point to open it up. Uh, for audience questions, because I'm, I'm sure I have a feeling there might be a few. <laughs> and um, so um, there's a microphone, there's a person with a microphone. So if you want to ask a question, um, please just identify yourself and, and ask a question uh, and instead of making a, a long statement. Uh, anybody want to? No questions? Everyone agrees with the, the whole panel? Okay, <laughs> over there. Hi, uh, Mark Innsberg. Uh, Michael, nice Hi to Mark. see you. All Michaels. Mm -hmm. uh, and John. <laughs> and John. Uh, Sykes Picot, Vice President Biden, Division of Iraq, Division of Syria, redrawing the map, looking over the horizon to the next administration. Uh, what would each of you recommend if you had the chance as to how the political strategy? should be played out by the United States in both Syria and Iraq? Is it a continuation of the same? <laughs> or are you going to be more creative in your thoughts about how to extricate the United States from the piecemeal approach that has been engaged in as you all laid out? You know, I, ironically, um, even though there's, a, you know, I think a lack of a strategy or a, or a bad strategy, um, it, Ironically, I think there's the right pieces in place for the correct strategy moving forward. You know, the use of U.S. air power, uh, which continues to dominate the world and will dominate the world and dominates on the battlefield, uh, an advisory effort both, uh, you know, both tactically and more operationally. So tactically, it's important. And this is the nuance that this administration is finally kind of coming to. You have to have you know, my background is as a Green Beret and a special operator. You have to be on the ground with your host nation force. But then at the same time, you have to be at kind of the ministry level, helping with logistics, human resources, manpower, force protection, those types of things. And then a, and then a CT uh, approach to keep you know, these irregular actors, whether it's, whether it's um, ISIS or Al-Qaeda or the Taliban or what have you, on their back feet. Uh, but what the administration does is, one, under-resource the effort, and then two, ties their hands so that we're, you know, it's kind of like having a football uh, team on the field. We get credit, they're on the field, but they can't run the ball, they can only pass to certain receivers, and the quarterback has to call the team ownership for every play. Um, so, you know, we have them out there, but we're really not letting them do what they're, what they're best uh, able and capable of doing. In terms of the broader strategy, look, 
you know, I disagree with the Saudis and their approach on many, many, many things. But the one thing I think King Salman has um, crystal clear is that the Iranians are going to run as hard and as fast as they can, both in arming themselves through the Russians and through their proxies under the cover of the nuclear deal. And the reason they're doing that is nobody's confronting them. So the thing that has me concerned is in the lack of American leadership uh, and the lack of American engagement at every level, um, you know, the Saudis are, are kind of taking things in their own hands, and so are our friends, the Emiratis and, and others. They've, they've formed a coalition to confront terrorism because they're criticized about ISIS and Sunni extremism. Iraq's not invited in the coalition, Iran's not invited in the coalition, but friends like Malaysia, Sudan, and others, it's not clear what it's going to do, but we're seeing alliances and partnerships and others form outside of the U.S. umbrella, and, and I don't know where that goes. Um, so I think for the next administration, we need to get that, try to get that genie back in the bottle. And, and that's what I, I would add. You did a great job in discussing the very tactical and the operational, but the last thing you said, mm -hmm. I think, is what the next administration has to understand, mm -hmm. that U.S. leadership is essential. I mean, one of, the, one of the other principles the president said at graduation was America leadership is indispensable. Well, where is our leadership in this, in this region? The engagement and, I mean, the Secretary of Defense yesterday spoke at, um, at, the, at the CNAS conference, and he talked about networking and, the, and engagement and how important that is. Uh, the United States is absolutely <coughs> positioned to leverage those relationships to, to lead towards solutions in the region. So I, so I couldn't agree more about mm -hmm. the importance of our, our leadership and engagement, and that's essential. Over here. Zucco. Um, my question uh, to the whole panel is what's your opinion on arming the Kurds and possibly getting the Yazidis to join them? I think in general for Iraq there should be a willingness to work more with regional partners but doing it in the absence of a strategy with Baghdad is dangerous and so that's the conundrum that we've been in which has led to paralysis the Iraqis themselves have contributed. They've got a concept, as you know, for a National Guard, but it's gone nowhere, partly because I think the Shia government worries that National Guards led by Sunnis in some of the Sunni provinces could pretty quickly develop an offensive capability and march on Baghdad. So we have a lot of internal sectarian tensions that are fueled. With the Kurds, no one's going to expect them to march on Baghdad, but they could march on Kirkuk. In fact, they already sort of are. And so, understandably, at one level, uh, they're watching out for themselves. So I think to do this right, we have to have some kind of integrated strategy that helps the regional, helps the national government feel confident the regional proxies or regional actors are not going to challenge its authority excessively. I can only think of one way to do that in Iraq today, which is to increase our presence in every way. The one thing you're not supposed to say, right? And we're all supposed to be, we're all used to the concept of getting out, reducing. And the only debate is how fast do you reduce? In Iraq, I want to go back with more. Not just more people, but more money and a long-term time horizon for a security commitment. Maybe not an alliance, because I'm not sure that's a realistic thing to put before the U.S. Senate uh, at the moment, given Iraq's recent behavior in many domains. But a long-term security commitment that says we are with you for 10, 20 years at this level of resources. And that would include economic assistance that is provisional, that is conditional on their good behavior. Uh, and so Baghdad, of course, as you know, is in a hurt, a world of hurt right now because of oil prices. So if we're prepared to give Iraq a billion dollars a year in economic and security aid, in, but, but what they have to do is allow regional arming of some of these groups, and then we also promise a long-term American presence that's going to help them with their worst case worries about others challenging them. I think that's the only way you can tie all the pieces together. Long-term commitment, more aid, continuation of the military presence. Because that allows you to strengthen the regional actors without causing the risk of any of them taking on Baghdad directly in a military sense. So yes to your question, but it's got to be embedded in a much broader approach. Um, I was in the, the second, the second, not the second, then we're going to move on to the next question. The, uh, uh, the I have to say that I was um, with the Peshmerga when they took Sinjar um, from the Islamic State in November, and I've spent some 
quality time up there. And there's more going on than I think people realize. First of all, mm -hmm. um, they are being armed. And uh, the, uh, on Ash Carter on a trip I was on in December uh, announced that they were getting two brigade equipment sets. Uh, they don't get the heavy arms that the Iraqi army has, but they are getting modern arms. Second, um, uh, the uh, KRG leadership was here uh, recently including and appeared in an FDD panel mm -hmm. and uh, on um, what's came to be known um, uh, sort of as the begging mission and they got, <laughs> they've got $400 million. They've, they've got a commitment from the United States to help pay the Peshmerga because they argued they were three months in arrears. They couldn't pay their own forces. Uh, the administration stepping up and doing a lot of that for them. So they're not getting the kind of heavy arms that uh, the going through the FMS system that the Iraqi army is, but they are getting arms. They are getting money. I think there's more one could do, and there's a fairly extensive uh, U.S. Uh, presence in Erbil, including the so-called Expeditionary Targeting Force, otherwise known as JSOC and Delta, which has been conducting operations out of there. So I think you could do more, but it's, it, there's more going on than I think people realize. In the back, there was a question. Thank you. Richard Kramer from the National Endowment for Democracy. This is primarily a question for you, Michael Waltz, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but <coughs> um, anyone can feel free to jump in. I agree that a confederation is, I'm open to the idea. Um, certainly, it might have worked better for Bosnia and Herzegovina. But in any case, um, I'm wondering, I mean, I don't think Turkey is entirely lost. And I recognize, at least in my own opinion, that Turkey is a fundamental member of the transatlantic alliance. How is it that, w do you feel, that we're going to be able to potentially pursue the idea of a confederated Syria while calming Ankara and making sure that their interests are being well protected? Is that realistic? Thank you. Yeah, thanks. I'm not there yet uh, where you know, Michael Hanlon, I think, is on the, on the confederated Syria. We may not have a choice, but I, I'm still of the view that we need to take on both the Assad regime and ISIS. And I know that's a big statement at this point, but you know, the Assad regime is an extension of Iran, and if you buy into my notion that we need to confront <coughs> Iran, uh, we need to conf and we need to do it with U.S. leadership, um, both through their proxies, both through their conventional arming, and through this god-awful nuclear deal, um, then we have to confront their surrogates as well, uh, number one. Number two, if you look at the amount of civilians that were killed, uh, it's awful across the board, but the Assad regime, uh, from just a human rights standpoint and from, uh, frankly, a war crime standpoint, I don't see how we allow the Assad regime to continue. And three, uh, we haven't gotten into Ru uh, you know, Russia, but I don't think we allow Russian leadership uh, back into the Middle East and Russian intervention back into the Middle East uh, through the Assad regime. So I'm not there yet on, a, on allowing a coalition. I think what Michael says makes a lot of sense. Uh, we may, with this current administration and potentially a follow-on, uh, administration that buys into this current strategy. We may not have any choice. It's the, it's the kind of best bad option. Um, but if Mike Waltz has it his way, uh, we, start, we start aggressively both confronting Assad and, uh, and ISIS in Syria. Over there. Hi, I'm Dan Raviv with CBS News. A lot of this discussion could take place even if we weren't in the middle of a presidential election <laughs> campaign, but we are. <laughs> so there's a good chance that all of you have been in touch with um, defense, military, strategy advisors of both campaigns, if they exist on the Republican side. <laughs> and uh, what are you hearing? What m might happen in the areas you've been discussing if it's a President Trump or a president who was until recently the Secretary of State? Why don't you start? That's the one we were all hoping not to be. Yeah. CBS. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Well, I think that um, let, let me start with Mr. Trump because it's sort of fun to speculate because you, you, you don't have necessarily quite as elaborate of a, a cohesive platform, so you have to piece together different <laughs> things you've heard. And, and one thing he said is he doesn't want a lot of American forces in the region. He doesn't want another Iraq invasion. He, however, does want unpredictability and he wants to win and he <laughs> wants to be aggressive. 
Uh, to be honest, it doesn't sound actually mutually contradictory to a lot of the ideas that I hear, let's say, from the Clinton campaign, mm -hmm. except the Clinton campaign is actually, uh, I think, a little closer to recognizing that it's hard to do those things. And so uh, when you hear S Undersecretary Flournoy yesterday, for example, talk on this issue, and it's, you know, uh, Defense One today was saying she's the likely Secretary of Defense nominee for Hillary. Let's say she's one of several who could be in that camp and you hear the kind of thinking that she's put forth, she is wrestling with the notion of how do you put more pressure on Assad, put more pressure on ISIS, and do it with modest resources, but more than we've got now. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, uh, I, I like the way her thinking is going on that subject. She was a little more forward-leaning than Hillary Clinton. Hillary gave a speech on Syria last fall. I think that's the last time she tried to give a detailed uh, assessment of where she might go. She talked about these safe havens. She talked about no-fly zone options. But those concepts, I agree with them, but those concepts don't really tell you how and where to implement them. And so uh, I, th I think the kind of detail we saw yesterday from Secretary Flournoy is the more serious way to go, what you're hearing today from my co-panelists. Uh, and I think that's the kind of dialogue that the Clinton campaign is probably having internally. Uh, but I'm not going to give them a complete carte blanche because making it work is the hard part. <laughs> you know, it's easy to say a little bit more of this, a little bit more of that. And, and frankly, I am still skeptical, having heard my friend Michael here say that he still wants to put pressure on both Assad and ISIS. I'm skeptical you can do both those things successfully with only modest additional forces. So the question I have for both candidates is how are you really going to drive Assad from power while you're beating ISIS and keeping American commitments low? Uh, and I don't think anyone has satisfactorily answered that question. That's just the Syria angle, but that's probably the hardest one. Well, if I could just quickly add, I mean, I think one of the reasons we've struggled so badly in Syria is we've, we've tried to tell our erstwhile allies, uh, and I say that with some pause, but we've tried to tell the groups that we're supporting, uh, you can fight this enemy, but not, not the one you really want to fight. Um, so I think we've you know, again, through bad strategy or no strategy, severely limited our options to where now we almost have, now we have no options. Um, I'm not going to comment on where I think Mr. Trump's going to go because I don't think he knows where he's going to go yet, just to be candid. Um, yeah. one, one point I, observation I have as the neutral uh, moderator is the, <laughs> um, is, so I just came back from, from the Middle East and I was in Qatar and Kuwait and I spent some in and out of Iraq a bunch of times. So um, uh, uh, Mr. Trump, big theme is he's been critical of, um, I don't know, Islamic uh, um, extremists, but very often it sounds as if he's uh, critical of, of Islamic states generally. And you know, we have a, uh, the air war is being run out of uh, Qatar, the air war in Syria, the air war in Iraq, the air war in Afghanistan is been being run out of the Combat Air Operations Center, known as the CAOC, because everything in the military has an acronym, in Qatar. The, gr the uh, command um, headquarters for the uh, CJTF OIR, which is the name Operation Inherent Resolve that no American's ever heard of, of our campaign against Islamic State is in Arabjan, Kuwait. Uh, the air bases from which the B-52s and most of these aircraft take off are either in the Arab states, Jordan, or Insulik, Turkey. This entire war fifth against the Islamic State, fifth fleet in Bahrain. the Fifth Fleet in Bahrain, this entire war against the Islamic State is enabled and could not be prosecuted without the active cooperation and support of uh, Muslim countries in the region. And in there, I sense a contradiction in the tone of um, Mr. Trump's pronouncements and his argument about how he's going to uh, deal with the Islamic State by stepping up um, air operations. It just strikes me as in incoherent. Um, questions? Over there? Shoshana Bryant, Jewish Policy Center. Mike O'Hanlon, you made a good case for going back into Iraq in various ways, a case with which I happen to agree, but what would induce the Iraqis to say yes? We are not exactly a long-term stable partner. Um, they have to make some obeisance to, <coughs> to Iran, who is not only their next-door neighbor, and we're not their next-door neighbor. And 
with whom they have certain attributes in common. So if you were the Iraqi government, what would induce you to believe an American president who says, look, for the next 10 years, I'm going to do this for you. For the next 20 years, I'm going to do this for you. We don't exactly have a good track record. So how do we get them to agree with us? Excellent question, and it's not going to be easy. A couple of points I would make, though. Uh, one is that we are now into our, what, 13th year, and we, had a, we took a couple of years off our little sabbatical, <laughs> but it didn't work out so well. And so I think, you know, I think we have to, on the one hand, just use recent history as our best argument. We like to say in Washington and elsewhere Americans aren't strategically patient. I think that's nonsense. We st we've stayed in, s in Korea for decades, and for many of those years, South Korea was not a democracy. Mm -hmm. uh, and the same thing with uh, our friendship with Taiwan, even though it wasn't backed up by military force. We've stayed with NATO for decades. Uh, we've stayed with Afghanistan for 15 years. People say, oh, we're so sick of Afghanistan. Yeah, but we've been there 15 years in a row. So it looks to me like a pretty good track record of resoluteness. Whether you agree with the war effort or not, I think we should at least give ourselves some credit for more patience than is common to talk about when people you know, look at our collective naval and say, well, we Americans are impatient. I, I don't see that in our strategic debate. I see a lot more continuity. We can be at each other's throats in policy debates, especially on Capitol Hill and the campaign trail, but the policies don't change that radically. And so um, I think that's a good thing in many situations, not always, but in many cases. With the Iraqis, I would also say, you know what, they don't like us, but they know that they can trust us. And that's a little simplified, blunt statement. I think it's basically true. Of all the countries in the world that have a role in, in, in Iraq, historically or currently, we're about the only ones that nobody would say they're just the friend of the Sunni, just the friend of the Kurds, or just the friend of the Shia. So most Iraqis, if they can find a way to triangulate on this with Iran, and you know, and and of course they are being coerced and bribed and every other form of uh, you know influence coming out of Tehran that's imaginable. Um, but if they can find a way to 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 deal with that and still have us with a long-term partnership, they're going to want that because they know that we do not have a sectarian agenda or an imperialistic agenda. We've made a ton of mistakes in Iraq, and we are generally disliked, but we are generally trusted. And that's, to me, a very important distinction that w we're sometimes afraid to say out loud uh, because people who want to say the mission's been great don't want to acknowledge that we're disliked. We are. Iraqis don't really, whether it's in public opinion polls or in how close most politicians want to be to us, as a nation we aren't that warmly viewed. But we are viewed as neutral and as a counterweight to Iran and everybody else. So that's why I think we have something going for us. If I can just add to that very quickly. You know, completely agree with, with what Michael's saying, and, and that's why it's one reason why arms sale to the region, while alarming and while it kind of makes headlines, are also very important. Uh, if, if the Iraqis, uh, if the Saudis, if our Emirati friends and others have American F-16s and American firearms, and the Afghans for that ma matter, it makes our engagement much easier over the long term, and if we're just completely frank and blunt, it also gives us leverage in a lot of our dealings. They're under the U.S. sphere um, and not buying from the Russians or others. That's a good thing, I think, all around and, and helpful for us going forward. See, now he wants to sell airplanes. <laughs> <laughs> Back there. Hi, uh, Charles Perkins with APAC. Um, jumping off of Mike Waltz's statement about um, arms sales, we saw a situation two years ago where a lot of American hardware in the Iraqi military fell into the wrong hands. We were fortunate in the case of Egypt where things have turn out, turned out okay. We didn't know which way things were going to go in 2011. Um, some American arms to non-state actors in Syria have ended up in the wrong hands. General question. Um, the Gulf states are stable, certainly, but how do we weigh the degree of risk in providing military technology, especially high-end, cutting-edge platforms, um, drones, whatever kind of technology? Uh, how do we weigh that against the risk uh, that it will ultimately end up in wrong hands? And we're talking uh, in the wrong hands, and this is a technology that you know, certainly can last for uh, decades or more. And this is acknowledging that, you know, if we if we don't sell them, somebody else may. Um, that they have a short 
logistics tail and we can, you know, the, the equipment won't last very long if, uh, if it ends up in the wrong hands. But just as a general principle, how would you, uh, how would you weigh that risk? I, I would say that the issue wasn't necessarily the arms sale. The issue was the, the sabbatical, as Michael calls it, was the absolute U.S. disengagement and, and leaving the region. I mean, that's an issue in Afghanistan now. Uh, that's an issue that obviously was an issue in Iraq. I don't think the solution is, you know, don't bring our, our allies or folks that we want it under kind of our influence and, and our sphere uh, over through arms sale. The issue is if you sell the arms, you have to remain engaged. Um, and no, but I, I don't think, that, know, could, I don't think really that could be overstated. Yeah. The fact that it's not just about the equipment, it's about the relationship. We're selling the relationship. We're not just selling the piece of, piece of equipment. Many people will argue, and I think I, th I think it's a good argument, that the reason why Egypt acted a certain way is because cer some of our leadership could pick up the phone and talk to their classmates. They went through, you know, mm -hmm. senior service schools with some of the Egyptian generals, and they were able to talk through some of these things. So it's so it's it's absolutely about the bigger picture and that engagement piece as well. That's an important part of the equation. So, Bob, well, we've exhausted our time and there's a, another panel uh, coming up and I think th this group has done a very good job of um, setting the stage for the ensuing discussion so I'd like to thank you for what I thought was very wide-ranging very candid and and spirited uh, presentation on, a, on a, a wide array of different uh, different subjects thank you.